Welcome everyone to First Unitarian Church of Honolulu's uh, weekly, mostly weekly, when I'm not being lazy, uh, Palhana experience here, where once a week we uh, have a little time to talk about things on, on our minds or things we're able to or invite guests. And in this case, we're both talking about things that are interesting with uh, a guest that we love, uh, a friend of our congregation, the wonderful, the extraordinary, my friend, Duro Farrar. Hi, Duro. Hi, Duro. Hello. It's so uh, good to see you all again. Aloha. Hi, Duro. Aloha. Hello. So we, uh, we are all here. Uh, and as just a few little reminders, this is being recorded. It'll be on the, the church website where, I mean, I mean, dozens of people, uh, <laughs> dozens. Veritable uh, dozens. Eh? <laughs> veritable dozens might see it. Uh, so just bear that in mind as, uh, as you allow your video to be displayed. Currently, the way it works is even though you can see yourselves above or whatever, it'll just be Duro and I unless uh, I bring one of you into the spotlight. Um, and then uh, you can also just send me questions as you go along the way. Uh, we don't have a large group today, so if something comes up to your mind and you want to ask it, it's, it's easier if you sort of private message me, but you know, rules are meant to be broken, friends. Do whatever your heart desires. Uh, and uh, so I always ask, and because I think we have some new people here, uh, the first question I usually ask in, uh, in, in a Pauhana is, who are you and what do you do? And that was for me? Yep. The answer, okay. Just well, um, my name is Duro. Uh, I am a musician currently serving as the director of music uh, for the First Unitarian Church of Portland in Oregon. And um, I do some other things too. What's, what are the other thing, what, what other thing do you want to tell us about that you're working on? Do you have any theater stuff going on? Any um, I sing, I sing in a professional choir here in Portland, Oregon called Resonance Ensemble. Um, I also, uh, I'm on the advisory team for Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. I am the president of the Association for UU Music Ministries. And uh, you probably don't know this yet, most of you, um, but I'm also a, a seminarian at Star King School for the Ministry. Interesting. Interesting. I do a few other things. Yeah. Um, how do you have time to do all this stuff? <laughs> oh, I don't. Oh, okay. All right. I don't. Sometimes it just doesn't get done and that's okay. Okay, uh, that'll, that's actually, that's a good, uh, uh, that's a good lesson for anyone working in the church world or just working today. Do you think, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, one of the things that uh, happened when the pandemic began, just this is to everyone, is that uh, a call went out for more introverted people to recognize that their extroverted friends might be suffering because of the pandemic and not having uh, contact with the outside world. And Duro was one of the kind friends who just checked up on me more <laughs> in my sort of knowing my extroversion that I might be, I don't know, just mindlessly watching 30 Rock uh, reruns or something. And uh, do you find that in the pandemic, it's easier or harder to quote, get more done with all the things you're doing or does it not really matter? Um, <clears throat> I find that it's easier to get more things done and harder to want to. Interesting. Yeah. Everyone is, you're in the land of nod to row. Everyone is doing this. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah. Now, cause your work is so, I mean, you have these ensembles, right? How many people are in ensembles at the church? Um, currently it's low because not everybody's participating. So it's about, I don't know, 200 people, give or take some. And so keeping them busy through the pandemic could not have been easy or how did that work? It was not easy and we, and we didn't uh, keep all of them busy. Um, so we did a, a, a monthly gathering of our music ministry folks, much like this, where we would gather and check in and see how each other are doing and you know hear the news of our lives i would give updates about the church and, and the ministry um beyond that one of my colleagues his name is john would, would would lead a virtual choir um 
where he put hours and hours and hours and hours of work into creating these really beautiful videos um, for our choir to participate in. Uh, my colleague Amanda did the same thing with our bell choirs um, and did some virtual bell choir content. Uh, and that, that held us for about a year. Um, and I, I, I declared that I could not ask them to do that again because of how much work it is. Yeah. So do you, I found personally that there is sort of an energy that built and built through what is the unofficial Unitarian church year. Uh, the Unitarian calendar, for those of you who don't know, only has 10 months. Um, uh, and they, it goes from, you know, September through, uh, through June. Uh, July and August are just optional and I'm, I'm being kind of silly but not really uh, and so when September rolls around many of us see that as sort of like the beginning of the year is that rolling into September now without the with with us at least here being still uh, very cautious about gathering in any way um, you know the the impetus for some of our musicians and things like that to continue doing recordings and videos and and syncing and me using, you know, file cut pro to, to do all this stuff, just couldn't do it anymore. And so, you know, now we have one or two musicians masked or unmasked, like one unmasked at a time singing, uh, on Sundays and sometimes me singing harmony from the pulpit, uh, you know, 10 feet away. That's kind of what we've gone to. Is that, is that what, what are, what's music looking like for you these days? Yeah. So in addition to, so the other things that we did for the full uh, ministry, we also um, had a quartet um, and our keyboardists come in every Sunday morning and provide music, mostly for the hymns, but also some, some voluntaries and things like that. Um, whether there are solos or ensemble things, but we, you know, we have a big enough sanctuary and chancel that we could sort of spread out and do that. Um, we will continue that for hymns going into the fall, but uh, our choirs are returning. Um, they will not be in the chancel. We have uh, developed partnerships with the UCC church and the Presbyterian church close by um, for our Wednesday and Thursday night rehearsals. And we are spreading out our choirs in, in their sanctuary. Um, wow. And, you know, we're asking, we're demanding that everyone be vaccinated and masked and, and healthy. Um, and we just spread out throughout the whole sanctuary and we're using that as our, our rehearsal hall. Uh, and we will record some of those pieces and use those as videos in the Sunday services in the coming year. Exactly what music school uh, prepared you for, Darrow. That's right. As opposed <laughs> to this other thing I've been doing for a year and a half. Right. Yeah, it's uh, perfect. Yeah, spreading out an entire choir in a cavernous ship. ship. People don't know the first church, uh, oh. first Presbyterian church is made from an old ship. All the right. wood in the sanctuary is from, an, uh, from a wrecked ship. And it's beautiful. But uh, yeah, and then not to mention what you did for the last year, year and a half, which, you know, being an opera director and an arranger and everything, I'm sure prepared you for. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot. Um, and you were speaking about hymns. Uh, it's one of the things I wanted to, it was on my mind uh, today and was thinking about, we, we touched a little on hymn singing and hymnody uh, uh, last time you were with us, maybe six months ago or something like that, maybe more actually. Who knows? Yesterday is the day. Tomorrow is is yesterday. Who knows? Uh, but uh, it it definitely gave me some thought, and I'll tell you why. We did a music survey of our congregation. Uh, our, our congregant Beth Byers is sort of co. She's she has a, she's a member here and a member in Bellevue, and num runs numbers very well. Is also a musician. Uh, reads she plays reads and also sings. Has perfect pitch. I'm just saying. Um, and uh, she did a music survey and 84% of our congregants, their favorite musical expression was singing hymns together. And so that, I'll tell you, that was a shocker to me as someone who maybe comes from a more uh, performative, if you will, musical stylings and enjoyment. What? Has that been your experience in churches, that level of really enjoying singing hymns? Yeah, well, <clears throat> whether people frame it as uh, the, the most enjoyable part of a service or, or their experience, or whether they just say it as the most important or they experience it as the most important. Important. Um, it is my, it is, that is my experience that people really uh, 
uh, feel really strongly that it's important until it's not good. Uh, there are lots of congregations that don't have a that have uh, poor quality um, hymn services, and 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 you you'll find that those congregations don't actually care about the hymn singing that much. What they do you mean have, by a by a poor quality hymn singing service? Well, where it's just not led well. Um, the the hymns are not chosen with care. Um, maybe it's very repetitive. We do the sixteen hymns that we all know all the time. Um, they're sort of just sort of thrown into the service so that there's some participation, but not with any intent mm -hmm. or intention. Um, and you'll find churches like that and, and they don't know this, um, most of the time, but they don't, they don't care about the hymn singing. And so, but, but places where there's good leadership and where there's a little bit of care put in, um, will almost universally say it is the most important part of their church experience. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. One, because it's expressive. Mm -hmm. um, it really takes what is within and brings it out. Um, and, and it's communal. It's something that we do together. Um, it is embodied. It is, it is a way for us to use our, use our form in the service as opposed to just listening and receiving. We are able to give and participate. There are lots of, of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. I, I regularly say um, to anybody that will hear me that that congregational singing is the most important part of my job and almost everything else almost does not matter at all if the if I cannot get the congregational singing part worked out well so tell me about uh teaching hymns to congregations that want to sing I actually one of the I actually think we have a pretty diverse uh hymn I'm, I'm willing to not go toe to toe but like we actually sing a lot more than your standard 16. I mean, we sing like like 18 different hymns. So it means by percentage, that's a lot. Uh, no, sure. uh, I'd say I'd say we've got like, a, I mean, you can all disagree with me if you think, but I'd say we've got 30 to 40 that are probably in our our regular rotation with maybe another two dozen that you'll see throughout the year somewhat um and i know that's not enough for you uh can you tell me about because i remember this is kind of a loaded question you getting a plan like for teaching new hymns to people um because can you just tell us about your experience coming to either where you are now or some other church that was doing that and what you did to try to teach the hymns sure so I don't actually teach hymns. Um, I don't think that that is a uh, a useful um, a useful use of time and spirit in worship service. Um, so I don't teach hymns. Instead, what I try to do is two things. Um, if there is a new hymn that I would like to add, um, I'll try to add it before it's important. Um, so say the topic, mm. the the monthly theme or the sermon topic in May uh is um you know something about the earth we'll say um i guess i should say it's an april then so it's something about the earth uh, well is going to happen in april and there's an earth-centered hymn that i'd like to do that is going to be new and maybe a little bit challenging to us i will plant it sometime in the fall when it feels appropriate and maybe sometime again in like january when it feels appropriate um so that by the time Normally we plant in the spring and reap in the fall but you do you Dura. I do that's right I'm 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 oppositional all right um and 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 that way by the time by the time uh it has the most meaning for the service the congregation is at least familiar with it the other thing I try to do is uh to build a culture of not having hymns uh, not be, not not having a set of hymns that are familiar yeah and so there are new hymns introduced all the time um I I think here in Portland, we use, I would say about 40% of our hymns are not in either of the hymnals. Wow. Um, and we just, I just introduce hymns all the time. And so now I've been here for about five years that, um, that, that we've built a culture of the, the expectation is when I go to church, I will, I may see, sing something new and I no longer have anxiety about that mm -hmm. because that is, the, that is in the culture. Do you get any, so you get zero comments at all about hymns now? That's amazing, Duro. 
now yeah, yeah. It, you know it takes a couple of years to to, to wow. get there but how did you know that was going to happen was that an inspiration for you or is that something someone taught you or is it something you had a guess about um it's just sort of what i've always done i don't maybe maybe there was a starting point um but if there if there is a specific starting point, I can't remember when it is. Um. So one of the things that makes that raises for me is one of the things we we just did a jubilee weekend with um, with Paula Cole Jones, uh, Leon Spencer, and Latricia Leclaire. Um, yeah, those are That's impressive good. people. I know, I know. It was uh, it was quite a weekend, and it's the fourth time we've gotten to do it, so it's pretty it's pretty awesome. Uh, Latricia told a story about a friend she grew up with. And I won't go into the whole detail, but one of the things she really stressed was his different way of knowing, his way of perceiving and understanding that was different from hers. She was a, she excelled at school, at learning, at at being a smart kid. And I want to I'm not to tell any more of anybody else's story, but uh, I was just it made it it got in my mind about other ways of knowing. And I read music. It was a language I was taught as a child because my parents had money to send me to lessons and but also I got a little insane about it and became obsessed and so uh can you talk some about because that's just the way I know to learn music and I actually have a problem when I now have to learn things by ear because I want the music and then I've even heard stories that reading music if you don't really know music well can affect your intonation because you're not actually singing it in the right key like there's issues with it because you're looking at the intervals less than the feel. I know I'm kind of geeking out everyone, but go with me that, that the, there's a, actually a more deep, accurate way of learning that isn't about looking at the music. Cause there's something about just always having to do this new thing that actually is like learning new muscles or is that, is that a way of knowing or a way of teaching that comes out? So. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I think more people read music than believe read mu they read music, um, and this is why uh, singing a hymn or any kind of group song will always go better if you're reading it out of a hymnal than if you're reading it off of like a lyric sheet. Okay. Um, because even if people even if people are completely musically illiterate, um, we we you know at least. Uh, at this time and in this place can recognize the shapes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can see the visual rep representation of the music and that actually guides us more than we, we recognize. Um, if we have to rely completely on our, our, our listening, um, it becomes interpreted. It becomes an interpreted experience, right? So I'm, I, it's, like, it's like a game of telephone. I'm going to relay what I think I'm hearing um, at the same time that I think I'm hearing it. And so, uh, I would argue that it is maybe more human and maybe less accurate. And we get to decide which one we prioritize. Okay. Interesting. Um, one of the one, someone, someone asked me, can you talk a little bit about the difference between leading uh, hymn singing with a choir versus not having a choir? And is it harder, easier? I'm guessing it's a little easier with a choir who's kind of leading it, getting this wall of sound, singing the song. But um, yeah, the difference between like a congregation with us that has maybe one song leader that is leading the, the melody uh, and vice versa. And so anything about that that you found, like maybe a pointers for a church that doesn't have a choir, maybe would be a good way to put it. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I think it's definitely easier with the choir if you've taught the choir the hymns, or if you've uh, at least <laughs> given, if the hymns are not sight reading it with the rest of the congregation, right? Right. Um, for, for churches that don't have um, a choir, I personally believe that it's almost never better to have one person leading hymns by themselves. Um, two people, four people, whatever, whatever group of people you can gather, whatever small group um, you can gather will always make it uh, a little bit better. And the reason I believe that is because we sing differently when we're singing with others than we do when we're singing by ourselves. And you'll find that when you've got a solo song leader, um, it is often more difficult to sing along with the hymns um, because that solo song leader 
is doing all sorts of things vocally um, and intellectually and 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 interpretively um, that are that 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 mark a soloist, right? Um, instead of somebody singing an ensemble, and they don't realize they're doing it, uh, but they're doing it by nature of being sort of the center of attention, um, and it's it's actually harder for the congregation to sing along usually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so lately, I would say find some find some friends. Yeah, lately I've been singing along with our song leader, and it is it does change. Like we both have to sing the actual rhythms when the other. It's almost like a an understanding. It's like, well, if I try to go solo on this, it's going to sound bad, and so. Um, yeah, so it's been an interesting thing. Um, and we just leave it up to our sound person to figure out what it sounds like for everyone else. Uh, but yeah, very interesting. And there was a question about what shapes means, uh, in the notes, like looking at the shapes. Do you want to, for our folks who maybe don't read music, there's, there's some shapes right behind you on your whiteboard also. There are. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I don't know, let's just pick any hymn. Um, I don't know if you can see this, um, or maybe maybe you can see it, but it's maybe uh-huh. a little blurry. Um, so you'll see that if you're if you're singing along, um, even if all you see are dots and lines, um, you can actually see that the music is sort of taking a journey upward here, and then it's starting again. And it's taking another journey upward, and it's kind of it's kind of creating a flow. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know you were gonna start playing it. Sorry. Um, you can, and when we're reading the music, when we're reading the words, we can sort of see around the words, the, the shape, the motion <laughs> is maybe a better word that the music is taking. And we respond to that, um, you know, physiologically without realizing that we're doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, I learned, I really learned to read music myself at my sister's cello recital. And it was, she was in the Suzuki method. And if you had younger or older, older siblings, they handed out as part of the method copies of the songs that they were about to play. And they would tell even the people watching to follow along with the music. And it was a pedagogical way of teaching even people who are sitting there, at least giving them a chance to learn as well. And I remember noticing the difference between shorter notes that were filled in, longer notes that had circles, and when you're young, you start, you just see patterns, you know, I mean, at all ages you do, but I was old enough to, to recognize some patterns. And that was one of the ways I remember learning to read music. So, yeah. And I, you know, I learned all the music terminology um, in school, um, but I really learned to read music in church. And this is what, this is one of the reasons why I insist on using sheet music uh, in our, in our services for the hymns. Um, because I, when I was a kid, I really learned to sight read and I really learned to read music by singing hymns every week um, mm-hmm. and looking in these hymnals and, and being faced with every, every week. And so I, I insist on using the sheet music in part because I know that, that, that there is some child or some person out there uh, for whom this will be the, the totality of their experience with music and, and looking at it and, and being able to respond to it. Now, I mean, church hymns have a pretty decent history with teaching pretty decent musicians uh, pretty decent music uh can you i mean i don't got to say much about that but i mean i have a friend who is he plays guitar now in a a church in uh in compton and he's been having to learn uh a whole different level of musicianship uh that he's never had to learn before even as someone with a music degree in 15 years of professional uh music playing experience just the way that chords work the way the music works what's what how it is and and just as a story he then played a a wedding with all of the musicians he'd been playing with at church and they'd a song would come up like a stevie wonder tune or another funk tune and he'd he'd know what the song was but then the saxophone player would tell his friends which him that song stole from he'd literally call out the name of the hymn they'd play the hymn and watch him for the changes but and then it was a pop, but it was a funk or a pop song that had cribbed it, and so he's getting a whole like when that started happening, he it really changed his whole perception of well theft of music or borrow of music, but also relationship between church music and what we listen to as popular music. Uh, can you say something about that? Is that I mean I don't know if, if I've kind of just said it all, but 
Yeah. Yeah, I think you've said it. Uh, you've said it all. Um, and it's it's interesting. Uh, music is a music is not just a different language. It's a different set of languages with dialects and with you know different interpretations, different ways to read it. Um, and I think that's I think that's what what your friend is is maybe speaking to is that beyond knowing what music is and looks like and and how it reads. Um, there are these whole other layers of the music experience that play in, especially uh, to hymnody, which looks different in every church and every type of church. So that was, I mean, the thing I kind of promised people about was, was talking about hymnody. So I'm really proud of the people that showed up when we're having a chat about hymnody. Uh, can you say a word about what hymnody is? Yeah. Um, so hymnody really is just the um what is the word it is it is the existence the the, the world of hymns um it is a term that is used to, to to talk about the history and uh the repertoire um and the practice of hymn singing all in one word it's, it's all of those things i i always think of hymnody as as uh, fitting lyrics, interchanging lyrics to different famous meters, metered hymns. Um, this, this was something that this one dude in div school, heaven bless him, really thought he was amazing at. And he would just do it for every final project. He'd just write some new lyrics for some metered thing. And I got, it was, it was a little bit of a one trick pony. Um, and so I always have this kind of experience of that uh, in his his smug, adorable face, um, but yeah, anyway, that's another story. So, but the hymns, traditionally, historically, um, technically, are really just a set of words. So, a hymn okay. is a type of poetry, mm -hmm. um, much like an ode or a sonnet. It is uh, a hymn is a type of 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 poetry that is specifically. Um, uh, it specifically speaks about the relationship between uh, humanity and divinity, um, however we interpret that and however we make sense of that. Um, that is really what a hymn is, it's, a, it's the set of texts and it's always metered. Um, it, the, the meter is not always the same, um, but it is, it is, you know, rhyming, poetic, metered. Um, and then the music part is, a is the tune, the hymn tune, and that is separate uh, traditionally from the hymn itself, which is why um, I could probably find one and show you somewhere in here. Um, the oldest hymnals, especially, you know, even in Unitarian Universalism or Unitarianism and Universalism, um, the oldest hymnals are either words only or tunes only, or they're words and tunes in the same book, but printed separately. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was that way until the late, like mid late 19th century. Wow. Um, when we started, when we started seeing hymnals actually pair specific tunes with specific types of or sets of words um, in on the same page, printed together re, um, to be read together. What led Pairs to that? What led to the the change from the interchangeability to the fixation? Um, you know, I don't I don't know exactly, but I think it probably has something to do with the church's need uh, to. Um, simplify and control. Uh, it was around that time, around the mid 19th century, when we started getting really uh, opinions, strong opinions. Um, it was it was when ex you know when uh, globalization started to happen. People started to travel more, experience different communities, um, and so people started to get these opinions about which hymn, what 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 a hymn sounded like, uh, and so they would go, you know. They'd hear Amazing Grace with one tune one um, at their home church, and they'd go visit their their uncle's church, you know, two thousand miles away, and they're singing it to a different tune, and it would feel wrong. And so they just started to get really um, set in their ideas about what a hymn sounded like, which tune was the appropriate tune for which text, um, and they started to just cement that uh, by by printing it that way. Interesting. So each maybe each church or each denomination was starting to get what was sort of their flavor or their version? Um, I think it's each church. I think it's down to each church. Um, wow. Yeah. So music, I mean, was that, so 
yeah i i didn't really know that that history of of hymns like where that where that went and so um i mean taking that forward when when say this was printed uh-huh you know how much of that was going in you know to like they'll flash forward into into this i mean do you know much about the process of the gray hymnal or i know a little bit yeah um it was you know the commission um the the commission included my predecessor here mark slagers um as one of the people who worked on that hymnal um and it was so every every uu hymnal that has existed and this is the longest one we've had we've, ne we've never had a hymnal quite this long um but every hymnal is in response to the previous hymnal um and so uh, so this hymnal really was uh was about um diversify one diversifying our idea of god mm -hmm. um and two about uh about taking god language um and and really humanity language out of just being about men and making it about men and women i, I won't say that it it diversified gender but i'll say that it it added women to the mix yeah um and so and and the third thing that this uh hymnal aimed to do uh were to add voices um or it failed at this but to try to add voices or experiences for people of color and immigrants and so we it's the first time in, in a uu hymnal we start to see hymns in other languages and hymns that come from outside of the new england white experience and uh not all those not all those hymns age aged well and uh and work well in in uh in every setting in churches today you you said there were some failures uh one of the questions i had asked Doro when i was thinking about doing this topic was what what hymns would you tear out of uh the hymnal if you could and uh which or i actually technically asked which ones have you actually torn out of a hymnal that was more <laughs> my <laughs> uh but we i think we might have even chatted about this before but i am curious what some of the what some of the real fails are uh in your in your opinion where we where it fell short the most um sure i can give a few examples um so one is no more auction block mm -hmm. is one that's in our hymnal, um, which is a, it, it is the base tune for We Shall Overcome. It's where We Shall Overcome uh, was drawn from melodically. Uh, and it's in our hymnal. Um, it's, a, it's a spiritual uh, that sort of uh, uh, praises freedom. Um, but I, I just got to tell you, there's nothing more unnerving than being in a crowd of mostly white folks um, singing about their their denial of, you know, of the auction block experience, um, knowing that that is not a part of their experience. I mean, the, the metaphor just cannot extend that far. Um, and so I, th I think that's a real erasure and a real denial of, of true history and true experience. Um, so that's one that I will just never, ever do. Yeah. Um, there are other things like enter, rejoice, and come in, which I know is a big favorite for a lot of people, um, but I absolutely will not do it just because it just, there's no way to recover a worship service after that. It just, everything just feels overly silly. And if anything important you had to say cannot now be said um, because you're saying enter, rejoice, and come in. Um, there are more, more current failures like we'll build a land, which is on, you know, I have no particular problems uh, with the hymn itself, except for that it speaks to and responds to uh, an entitlement and a colonial perspective um, that uh, that I know um, lots of the the indigenous people that I know in Unitarian Universalist churches just cannot tolerate it, uh, and so I won't do that one because actually, um, you know we need to stop building lands and we need to stop you know uh trying to steal things and rebuild things and uh and conquer things we need to actually leave space for different experiences and different peoples to to have ownership over over the lands that, that already exist so um that's just a semantic one that i just i can't get down with mm -hmm. 
um, we are dancing Sarah Circle, which tried to do a which tried to tried to do a fun thing. It tried to take a spiritual and give it a feminist plot twist. Um, but in doing so, they completely erased the spiritual um, and 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 fixed it and corrected it, um, which denies the experience of a lot of people. I can go on and on and on. There are lots and lots of uh, of hymns. Uh, I mean, we are a gentle, angry people is another one that I won't do. Um, because it, it speaks to the, the, the expression, uh, the, the experience of white supremacy culture. Um, you know, there are some people in this country and in the world who just cannot be angry without getting in trouble, right? So it takes a, a, it takes a certain amount of privilege to be able to, to claim a position of gentle and angry. Um, but it also, it also, um, weaponizes uh, gentleness and makes it, you know, people who are not gentle while they're angry are somehow not as good. Mm -hmm. um, and then who polices that? And what is it, What where is the line? What is gentle and what is not? Um, and so I won't do that one either. There's a lot. So, and I don't want to get into any church dynamics, but uh, I mean, yeah, I do. Uh, how does it go when you don't want to sing the beloved the beloved tunes. Now you get to pick the hymns mostly, if not entirely, right? Is that part of the deal? Yeah, almost okay. entirely. All I, right. would say, so, I would say entirely, yeah. Because I know there's some some famous, pretty well-known sermons by some people you work with about being gentle and angry. And so I was just, let's not, <laughs> let's not do that because we love him. We love him so much. Uh, but anyway, that's a little inside baseball. Uh, but uh so let's move away from, I mean, not to go over, I, I think the, the takes on a lot of those, uh, um, you know, our church really likes to sing, uh, we'll build a land. So there's some conviction there. I feel convicted. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, and actually I might even just go into this, that a lot of people feel moved to tears during that song. Sure. And it, after doing Jubilee and what you said about it, it makes me wonder whether those tears aren't for some unnamed impossibility or some, in, some perceived like other way of knowing wrong that, that we're not doing this or we shouldn't be doing this or something hasn't, has been left undone. I mean, it's starting to make me wonder about what the, there's an old saying in pastoral care, when someone's crying, you're not sure why, tell me about the tears, you know? And I'm wondering now about that song um, and whether there might be something there. Yeah, it's, um, it's a beautiful and important message that has a bad metaphor. And so what do we do with that, right? It's got yeah. a beautiful tune, it's nice to sing. It, it quotes Amos. nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, it, it, it is the product of a colonial understanding of, of self. And so how do we hold all those things? What, what, what do we prioritize those moments? We'll give a land back to those from whom we took it. We'll give a land till all the people are free. And then till yeah. the oil of gladness rolls down like water oh we'll give our land back till all us are free because i mean that's you know please give the land yeah i mean i don't know there's something uh, uh -huh. that could be done so uh but even what i'm doing now is sort of uh um yeah fixing you know something else and uh but what are the ones you love are there any where I mean, or do you love hymns that aren't, or are the UU ones just kind of done and you love other hymns? Like, I, I, I mostly love other hymns, um, but um, I don't know, hymns that are, <clears throat> hymns that are in the hymnals um, that I truly love. I'm sure there are several, uh, but you didn't ask me that question. <laughs> I didn't. I was just curious um, if one would pop in. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. I mean, I, I know that there are some that I love. Um, Make Channels for the Streams of Love is one of them. I um, love it. And I don't know, I don't think our con congregation, I don't think you love it as much as I love it. I find it so beautiful. The harmonies are so open. It's very, um, I mean, it's written by a guy named Trench. I mean, who wouldn't want to sing something <laughs> by someone whose name is Trench? Yeah, I love that tune. 
Yeah. Or Let Love Continue Long is one of my favorites. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, there, there's, there are several. Um, yeah. Oh, The Beauty in a Life, which I'm not sure about anymore, but I, I still love it. Um, it comes from the, the Filipino Unitarian tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah we yeah there are several i like we do our we do a one of the filipino ones uh in october every year we have sort of annual hymns that we do as well sure so, yeah that's good have you written any hymns um i have i've not written very many but i have written some yeah i, yeah. I actually wrote one i i watched Oh, it must have been in, in March or so. Um, I watched uh, one of the David Attenborough uh, documentaries and got myself nice and depressed and wrote a, you know, wrote a hymn about it. <laughs> so a, na a nature hymn? It's a nature hymn. It's about essentially how humans keep fucking it up oh. and, and how we, we're, we've reached our last chance to do better. That, I'd like to open with that hymn. Maybe not close with it, but... Uh, I usually stick it right in the middle. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, we just we kind of do it during the offertory. Maybe people don't notice the. Well, you don't do you don't really like to do song offertories, right? Oh, uh, we don't do congregational offertories. Yeah. I I try to. I'm you know I'm Episcopalian. I love that, but um, the the folks here, um, the one time I tried it. They got very anxious about it, so I, I it. think I think I was there, and I might have <laughs> let it happen also because it might have been in the summer, but I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I don't remember. No, uh, but I do remember that discussion about the sun operatories. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I I think about you know the the hymns and a lot. And a friend asked me like today because I was talking about this this, and he said, you know what he was like, well, what's the point of the hymns? He's not really a churchgoer. He just thinks it's sort of, you know, sort of, you know, something that's there. And you've talked about sort of the points. And what I said was, um, there's something about the closing hymn that, that should, where the sermon or the message or the whatever lands that then speaks to something deeper, or like deepens our, our experience of whatever that is, or carries on or says something more that we couldn't say or perhaps couldn't express with our words, you know, that comes in in the music. That was like the best way I could describe it to him as someone who was just trying to understand where they, where they are and why. But um, I don't know if that has any resonance for you, but. Yeah, it does a little bit, but I, I, would, I would go even further. Um, so we sing a lot of hymns here. Um, we sing five hymns every week. Um, and I, I think that the first thing a, a church should do when they enter the worship space, I think the first thing they should do is something together, something interactive, whether it's a, a recitation of something, um, we do a hymn because you know that's what I have control over. So that's what we do. Um, so a, a hymn that says, that's, that, that sets the stage for what, what's gonna happen, whether, whether it's a, a hymn like, you know, gather us in or gather the spirit or something that, that, you know, that gets us into the room or it could be just setting uh, setting up the tone for the the theme, you know. Um, love will guide us if we're going to talk about love's power to 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 influence our decision making or or our peacemaking. Um, we and we do every hymn that we do is in response to something, and what I think it it provides um, is the opportunity. You know that feeling you get when you're in church and you've just heard a reading or you've just heard a prayer or had a moment of silence, or you just heard about you know, a beloved member of the church who's died or is really ill, or you've heard the sermon, or you know, you, you, after those moments, um, there is always an impulse to say something or to do something. And when the hymns are well-planned, um, they provide an outlet um, for our bodies and our expression to do something. Uh, in those times when we're feeling uh, called out by, by what we've just heard or experienced. What do you, yes. And I think that is one of the deeper, um, the deeper pieces. What is your feeling about um, popular music that has a hymn-like quality in that many people know the song and could sing along with it? Is that, do you count that in hymnody? Uh, I'm not going to say what the song is, but we're doing one of those this weekend that uh, 
this Sunday that everyone knows and it's popular and beloved, but also powerful and maybe a little bit more loaded than a hymn might be because it comes out of popular culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you, do you, you get into those waters, right? Yeah, not super often, but yeah, we've been known to, to sing a hymn by, you know, Avril Lavigne or the Beatles or Michael Jackson at times when that feels okay to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've in my lifetime, I've we've done hymns by Stevie Wonder and by Prince, you know, Diamonds and Pearls was a hymn once for me um, that we've done in worship. Um, so I think there can be appropriate times to do it. It's the hard part uh, comes around singability first, you know, mm-hmm. is the thing, the thing just because we all know it um, doesn't mean it's singable. So as is it actually singable? Um, Cause if it's not, that means we're all going to be singing it different ways at different times. It's going to fall apart. Um, and, uh, and does it add to the service or does it detract from what we're trying to say? You know? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of that balance of that's not just on you. Like you don't know where the sermon's going to go and how it's going to, you know, the music is set. Like, do you ever have a, a, an issue it's like well i'm, I'm gonna pick this sermon but man they better they better carry their water i'm gonna pick, i'm sorry i'm gonna pick this hymn but they better carry their water in the sermon otherwise it's not gonna go or like sometimes someone will pick something and they're like <laughs> it's like it's asking a lot of the preacher to to start one place or bring it somewhere else or whatever like how do you navigate that um <clears throat> excuse me different ways um each time there are times when the, when the ministers that I work with will just say, I cannot, I cannot preach up to the hymn that you choose. Like, I cannot, I cannot preach my way to the hymn you've chosen. Can we try, can we find something different? Okay. And I'll try to find something different. Um, but sometimes I'll say, look, Bill, you're going to, you're going to preach uh, about death. And uh, the hymn that I've chosen is uh, life calls us on. So uh, make it happen. Go. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, usually he'll rise to the occasion and it's, and it's fine. Um, Well, first he'll do this. He'll go. (laughs) And then he'll, then he'll do it. That's right. Yeah. He's like, is someone really talking to me this way? I was the president. What are you doing? (laughs) And then he'll go do it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, There's a, there's a question here. What about chanting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. I love chanting. Um, the you use just can't seem to get down with it. Yeah. Um, but I love it so much. It's so powerful. It can be so meaningful. Um, but you can feel, you can, you can actually feel the anxiety in the room rise when you, <laughs> when you introduce a chant. Um, you know, the closest we ever get is, is the, the, the Bobby McFerrin chant, the Psalm 20, the third to 23rd Psalm that's in the hymnal. That's the closest we can ever get uh, to a, you know, to a real chant, and that is a real chant. But um, oh, I would love to do more chanting. I mean, you come from the, the I would say not the the originator, but the water carrier of chanting. I mean, the Episcopalian, mm-hmm. the Anglican tradition, the way they have even notation, they have special notation for chanting, right. uh, where you change the pitch and and the different shapes of notes and this the square notes and things like that um yep. yeah that i could imagine that would be pretty powerful so yeah i would imagine a chant like a drip of water that makes a hole in rock mm. it's like the power of chanting is like the same power of meditation that when you do it and over and over a small drop of water can drill a hole through rock that's yes. that's kind of how i think of chanting it's intense yeah it can be um it can be. The other, the other thing I'll say is that we don't like to leave enough time for chant. Um, we like our services to move quickly and to be over in an hour and to be done. You know, we, we like to be on our way to lunch, um, you know, an hour and 15 minutes after, you know, after the service has started. So uh, we, just, we just don't like to leave the, the sort of spaciousness uh, that chanting calls of us. Yeah. Ah, what about, I mean, have you done much Vespers? We, we had a UU Vespers, some visitors come and we wanted to get all into it and things like that. And that was one of those things that happened in like 
February or January before the pandemic, and then we just couldn't do it. But do you, you maybe you could say a word about what that means to you, or have you had success with that? Because that might be a place where chanting would be more common. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, and I've done a little bit of them. I've done uh, Vespers that are occasional or for an occasion. Um, you know, I think TJ, when you were here, we did we did one for the election that year. Woo, uh, really? Yeah. Um, we, you know, and I've I've done a, a few since. I've done, you know, sometimes when there's been a shooting, a mass shooting, I, I'll do one. Um, and that you're right. That does leave the sort of spaciousness. Um, and we we could do more chanting there. I end up doing a lot of Teze sorts of things um, in those. Mm -hmm. but uh but you're right that there there could be more room for chanting yeah yeah it we could always use a little more chanting um yeah so we've covered a lot on uh on hymnody more than uh it, you know i'm i'm so impressed with all the people who hung in and uh wanted to give it a shot and learn a little bit more about it and we answered the very few questions there were about this um but uh yeah, I mean, one of the things I guess I'm I'm curious about is what's new and exciting coming up for you. Are you, I know you guys are going to be gathering again? Is that right? We're not gathering the church, but we are gathering the choir. And are they all going to sing unmasked in? No, we've bought. I don't have I don't have one here at my desk, but we we bought these fancy singing masks for them. Um, really? Yeah, they're you know they look a little bit like duck bills and yeah. Oh, I saw they go underneath like a mask. They're like a plastic um, frame. No, no, no. These are, um, they're, they, 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 they fit like a mask, you know, over the ears and, and, and over the face and mouth, but they, they, they're, they come out a ways. Okay. The, so to leave space for movements and for breathing. Yeah. Are these, are, is this forever? Um, I, you know, that is a good question. I, I think it could be, I'd like to think that it is not, it will always be an option. So if people, you know, if people would like to sing with a mask for the, you know, as an individual, um, it will always be an option, but at some point as a society, I think we're going to have to just recognize, um, that this reality is not changing. Um, it's not ever going to go back to feeling completely safe. It's not going to ever go back to feeling, um, completely normal and we're going to have to adjust our risk tolerance collectively in order to respond to that um if, if we're if we're going to recover any portion of our lives that we love yeah um and i recognize that we're not there yet but i think that we're gonna have to at least at, at some point get to the place where, where we just say okay and we've done all we can do um now is the time to take the risks and see what happens i Choral, choral singing is so important, like so central. I, it, the idea of not having it, it's one of those things in my brain that's just not, it, my brain won't let that thought linger long. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm just not willing to do a church without music, frankly. So yeah. um, that, that does not interest me. I'm sure that people have, I mean, people like you, TJ, have wonderful and important and eloquent things to say. And I'm just not interested. I'm just not interested in doing church without music. Oh, please. Seven minutes in, they're like, what's the hymn? What, what, what are the kids telling with the hymn? Uh, they are, they're, sometimes they're humming the, the closing hymn before I'm done because they're just trying to get me off the stage. So I think I've, uh, I think I've told you that I used to work at a Methodist church where if the summer was going on too long, I would just start playing the piano. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's congregational care at its best. That's just. Yeah. Yeah, that's just making sure uh, everything's moving along. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Yeah. Well, speaking of wrapping it up, it's seven o'clock here. It's 10 o'clock there. You're very nice to, I mean, I know you're a night owl, but you still took some of your best labor hours uh, or hour and gave it to us. So uh, we're very grateful for that. It is always my pleasure. Yeah, that's great. And uh, thanks to all the nerds who hung in to talk about <laughs> hymns. Uh, I'm going to take off the spotlights in case people want to say hi, uh, remove spotlight, remove spotlight. So if people want to go to gallery view and say hi to Duro. Hi, Duro. Hi, Duro. Hello. Aloha. I hope. Uh, Thank you. Aloha. 
I hope you're gonna, I don't, when we are, when we start singing again, we are, we're gonna have a nice little choir clinic again. I don't know how many people will come in and sing together, but um, another thing we could do is we have a lot of friends now, more than when I, when you came before, I'm more friendly with some of the churches now and uh, mm -hmm. we could maybe even get like a, a big choir thing together uh, and do something fun like that. So if you'd be down for fun. A, a choir clinic, it might be uh, a good time. So, uh, <coughs> well, everyone, I don't want to keep you from dinner and other things you've got, and I don't want to keep Duro from bed. So have a wonderful night. Enjoy. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>